What's going on everyone? Uh, my name is Dewey and uh, we're here at the, the Dewey Drome in Jamestown, Ohio. I'm here with a couple friends with some pretty cool airplanes and pretty much what this video is going to be about or some of it, we're just going to talk about the cool three airplanes behind us because it's in the same era and they're the big three airplanes that were in the general aviation world in the 40s. Uh, I'm Andrew King. I have the 1939 Taylor Crafts on the end of the line here and a frequent hanger outer at the Dewey Drum. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, frequent <laughs> hanger outer. <laughs> so uh, I'm Jesse Clement. I have the 1947 J3 Cub back here, and uh, this is my first time to the Dewey Drum. <laughs> yes, and I'm Dewey Davenport, and this is my 1947. Aronka 7AC champ. Well, uh, so. We're here in front of Jesse's uh, J3. He's going to talk about the J3 and then we'll kind of just add into it as we we feel. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. So uh, this is a 1947 J3. Uh, it came off the line uh, January 28th of 1947. So it was one of the last uh, J3s built. Uh, this one here uh, left the factory, lived most of its life in Florida. And uh, at some point, uh, was purchased by uh, Purdue University actually, made its way to Indiana, and then uh, the previous owner to me uh, acquired the fuselage and wings and stuff from Purdue and uh, ended up restoring it. Uh, this particular one here has the uh, C85 stroker engine in it, so it has a li little extra uh, horsepower. It's a, a really nice engine. Um, it's a blast to fly and uh, been flying it all over the place. How many years have you owned it? Uh, I believe this is year five. Okay. So. Oh, the history of the airplane, though. But Dewey, you sold him one, didn't you? Yeah, I. So I, I learned how to fly at Red Stewart in a J3 when I was 18 years old, and I, I don't know the date exactly when I soloed, but I, I believe it was October or November of 1990. Do you remember how much it cost? Three. Yeah, it was 26 dollars an hour, and the the instructor I think was 13 dollars an hour. I could come and rent the airplane for 13 dollars for a half an hour. Wow. So, and that's with fuel in it, and. Uh, that airplane is still at Red Stewart. They're uh, restoring it right now, and uh, it's in the in the hangar. So it's it's really really cool. What's the end number? I don't know. You don't remember the end number? No, I, I remember don't. mine. I I sold it in seven zero zero six hotel in Hampton, New Hampshire, at Hampton Airfield, right on the beach in New Hampshire, a mile from the beach in New Hampshire, in nineteen July 14, 1978, and it was sixteen dollars an hour wet, including fuel, and the instructor was eight. I was four <laughs> years old. <laughs> How old were you, Jesse? Uh, more like what? How old were my parents? <laughs> <laughs> what did you solo in? You solo in a Cessna? Yeah, 172 was first solo. How many hours when you got this? How many total hours flying? Uh, five or ten. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So, so you went, you just soloed and went right to the Cub then? Yes. Oh, well, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So one thing unique about Jesse, uh, you, if you go to Oshkosh, he gets to uh, speak there and his plane's there on display in the vintage, but uh, he's a young Eagles uh, pilot so or a student he came up through the young eagles program when he was a little kid a guy took him for a ride and a, a chief right yep ray johnson and his uh 47 ronka chief yep <clears throat> took him for a flight and since then he's plain broke he's oh, yeah. he's spending all <laughs> kinds of money he just graduated college at uh university of western michigan yep western michigan yeah. okay and uh got a cfi so he's he's going on the professional pilot route so <laughs> How many hours do you think you have in this, Andrew? In a Cub? Yeah. I think I have maybe 200 hours in a Cub, something like that yeah. at this point. Uh, and I, interesting, I have flown, the Cubs originally came with three main engines. Uh, there was Lycoming Cubs with a 65 Lycoming, the Continental Cub like this with a usually a 65 Continental, this is an 85. And they had a Franklin powered Cub, which are very, very rare. And I knew a guy that had a Franklin Cub once and let me fly it. So I've flown all three of the main types of Cubs plus the military L4 version, but it's interesting. One of the interesting things to me is uh, no no critique of the Cub, but this, of these three airplanes, this one is probably the least comfortable and the slowest, but it's also the most popular. And they built, what, 19,000? Uh, 19,800 or so. Yeah, almost 20,000. They were just, I don't know if it was because Bill Piper was so great at publicity or, or what it was. People just love Piper Cubs. And, but there are a couple of possible reasons. One thing is the doors on the side open up. You'll see, we'll go take a picture, but the doors on the side open up and it's almost like open cockpit flying with the doors open on the side. And it, it's just, there's just something about a Piper Cub that everybody loves. 
and they were they were a little bit earlier than these other two airplanes and in fact the one interesting thing is that the cub was really designed by a man named cg taylor and the first cub was an e2 cub it was called the taylor cub and bill piper was the money behind the company but taylor was a designer so they were taylor cubs and there was a taylor j2 and Piper and Taylor didn't really get along. We'll, we'll get into that when we go to my airplane, but uh, eventually Taylor kind of got forced out and it became the Piper J3 Cub. So uh, it's interesting. They maybe had a little bit of a head start in getting popular is maybe one of the reasons, but they're very fun to fly. Light on the controls and just very fun to fly and you can fly with the doors open. And uh, for some reason, the Piper Cub is just kind of the king of the hill of little two seat, 65 to 85 horsepower airplanes. One thing about the J3, it does fly well. It uh, like you said, it's light on the controls. It flies, in my opinion, better than a, a, a champ on being very maneuverable. But uh, when it comes to other stuff, I go with the Aronka. Well, Aronka has more room. Of course, the Aronka, the Cub is kind of a 37, 38 design, 1938 design. The Champ, the Aronka made an earlier version that was a little more similar to the Cub before the war. And then the Champ in 46, 45, 46, the Champ came out. So it's a little more advanced, but much more room. You solo in the front, you can see much better out of it, It's uh, and it is faster. Yeah. Well, Jesse, appreciate it. He came from Marion, Indiana. It took him over two hours to get here. Uh, but you know what? It's low and slow, and it's an awesome airplane. I'm glad he's here. I wish he would stay longer. <laughs> but uh, let's go over to the uh, Champ here and talk about the Champ real quick. Okay. This is uh, my Aronka Champ. It's a 7AC built in 1947 in Middletown, Ohio. So a little history that I, I really don't know a lot about Aronka other than I, when they first started building them, it was in Lunkin in Cincinnati, uh, right down on the river. They started building the C2 and the C3. I, I think the C3 was really the first production model. The first big one. Yeah. 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 And that's the flying bathtub. And then this, they built some other aircraft, some trainers, some defenders, different things like that. And then the Champ came along. It's a enclosed uh, pressure cowling, 65 horse. It's uh, a tail dragger, obviously, covered in fabric, uh, wood spars, uh, aluminum ribs. And the airplane weighs gross out to 1,320 pounds. It cost about $2,200 to $2,500 brand new. But when Aronka started in, in Lunkin in the 30s, in 1936, there was a flood of the Ohio River. There was uh, there's reports and pictures of aircraft floating down the Ohio River. Aronka actually closed up shop there and moved to Middletown, Ohio. And that's where the Champs were built, which uh, Middletown is just about 20, 30 miles south of downtown Dayton. And, you know, that's where the Wright brothers are from. That's really where a lot of aviation is here in Ohio. But uh, anyway, they built quite a few of them, about 7,500 Champs. I think they built over 10,000 different Aronkas, uh, low wings, defenders, different things like that. Um, I've owned this airplane for about 15 to 16 years. I've been flying it 25 years. And uh, a farmer that lived right down the road used to let me fly this when I was 20 years old. I'd, I'd get to fly it anytime I wanted to for free. He, uh, I kind of emphasize this. I'd call him up, ask him if I could go fly it. He'd show up, hand prop me. He'd always have fuel and oil in it, air, airplane be washed. And uh, about 16 years ago, he called me and sold it to me. I paid $13,500 for this airplane. Uh, since then, he's passed away about two years ago. Uh, his family, I still keep in contact with them. And I actually allow kids and, and even adults, uh, sometimes they get to fly the airplane for free. So I have about four or five people that, that has grown up around here that gets to fly the champ kind of like I did kind of just paying it forward so I call it the community champ and uh, we kind of just do a lot of things in my opinion I did solo in a J3 Cub I think uh, the champs a little bit better airplane it's faster roomier you solo from the front um, it's a little easier to fly in that sense uh, the J3 is more maneuverable it does fly really nice on the controls but the Champ is just uh, built a little better. Uh, for instance, rudder pedals and things with brakes. Their tabs are welded onto the frame of the fuselage. Not so much with the Cub. 
it's bolted onto some wood floors which could actually rot or get old and then you got to replace all that that's just stuff that I've noticed. <laughs> so, <laughs> typical anyway, champ owner. It's a typical yeah, champ. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can fight to the end. <laughs> so, um, but that's really about it. I'm not going to talk about a lot. It's. You guys have any experience with champs? Uh, uh, my, go ahead. Uh, my first lesson uh, going into my private pilot was in a champ, and uh, this summer I uh, obtained my CFI certificate and have been doing some training in them. I think uh, if you want to learn how to fly tailwheel, it's an excellent airplane to do it in. It's uh, a little more forgiving than a Cub, in my opinion. Uh, the uh, suspension on it is great. Right, right. So. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. When I learned to fly in Hampton, New Hampshire, the process was they had three Cubs. In fact, talking about history with Cubs, uh, as I say, the Cub that I learned to fly in is still in Hampton. It has 14,000 hours on it now. But uh, you would learn to fly in solo in the Piper Cub, and then for your cross-country work, you would use a champ because it was faster and roomier and stuff. And then when you needed to go to your radio, they had Cessnas to do the radio work and the final license work. But they, they wanted you to learn to fly in the Cub because it's more a little more challenging to fly. And it, so in that sense, it's kind of a better trainer in that it, it challenges you a little bit more. It's not as easy as the champ. And uh, so the Cub kind of makes better pilots. And then when you go to the champ, it's easier even to, to do that. But that was the thing in Hampton was learn to, solo, learn to fly and solo in a Cub and then do cross countries and your other that kind of work in a champ. Yeah, it's one thing that the champ, I, I say to people, this is the grandfather of the Satabria and of the decathlon. So if you look at a Satabria decathlon, it's pretty much a Ronca champ. Uh, they're just beefier uh, airframes and wings. Bigger engine. Bigger engines yeah. and obviously decathlon has a metrical wing and 150 horse compared to this is a 65 horse, no electric. Uh, it's the perfect modern day every every person airplane. It's like each one of these, and that's why Jesse's here. He doesn't have to have a radio, doesn't have electrical system, and we just fly low and slow, 500 miles or 500 feet off the ground and 65 miles an hour. So, all three of these airplanes. That's an interesting point. Is all three of these airplanes were good enough that they were later developed into more improved airplanes. The Champ kind of became the the the, the Cetabria and then the Decathlon that were aerobatic airplanes. The Piper Cub became the Piper Super Cub, and now there's still people today building variants of the, that are very similar to the Piper Cub, carbon cubs and, and different things. And then the Taylor Craft was put back into production in the 70s with bigger engines and things like that, and they're kind of popular in Alaska. Really, all three of these are popular in Alaska with big engines and big tires and stuff. So it was interesting that all three of these types of airplanes were good enough to be improved and get bigger engines and go faster and make models that were very similar but improvements. Well, let's go take a look at this uh, T-Craft. All right, this is the this is the 1939 Taylor Craft. This is mine. I just flew it out from Virginia uh, yesterday. It took about four hours of flying time to go 350 miles. It goes about 90 miles an hour or so. Uh, it was designed. This is the interesting C.G. Taylor Bill Piper connection. C.G. Taylor wanted to build an airplane where the pa the people sat side by side. The passenger sat next to the pilot. And Bill Piper liked the Cub design where the pilot sat in the back and the passenger sat in front of him. And it was such an argument between them that eventually CG was kind of forced out and he moved to Alliance, Ohio and designed this airplane. Uh, they had the Taylorcraft Model A, I think 1936 was the first one and it only had a 40 horsepower Continental engine. And then about 1938, they updated it, made the Model B. This is a Model B uh, with the first had a 65 horsepower, 65 like homing. Franklin uh, Continental like the Cubs, uh, but it was a side-by-side -side airplane. They kind of advertise it as the automobile of the skies. If you look in the cockpit, it has big round control wheels like a car wheel in it and where the other two airplanes have sticks. And uh, nowadays, most of us kind of like sticks. It's kind of cool to have a stick, but the Taylorcraft with the big round wheels is still kind of cool too. But you could sit next to your passenger. You could talk more easily. Back then, they didn't have intercoms and stuff. Uh, it's also pretty efficient airplane. It's probably the fastest of the three. If you look at the wing, the other two airplanes, the, the wings are flat on the bottom and this one is a little bit of a curve to it on the top and the bottom. And so it's a, it's a uh, I think it's an M6 airfoil, I think, or possibly maybe a 23012, but it's one of the semi-symmetrical uh, with a curved bottom wing section and that, that makes it very efficient. Uh, it goes, as I say, about 90 miles an hour the stock ones have 12 gallons of gas, burn about four and a half an hour, so roughly two and a half hours of flying. And so two hours is about the most you want to fly. The most I fly is 160 miles. But they, this is a 1939, November 1939. 
they, they built them almost exactly the same all the way up through about 1947. And uh, so these three airplanes, in 1946, these were the big three airplanes that competed against each other. And it was kind of whether you liked, uh, you know, Ford or Dodge or GM, uh, which one you liked and which one you bought. Uh, but they, the Cubs, again, almost 20,000, and the, what the, the champs were 7,500, 7, and I think they built about 62 or 6,300 Taylor Crafts like this. Uh, so Piper was really the king of sales. But, uh, but the, the, any airport in 1946, 47, 48, up into the 50s, you were very likely to see one or all of these three types of airplanes at them. And so it's kind of interesting to have all three lined up in a row right here. Uh, but that's, that's kind of the sc story of Taylor Craft. Taylor was involved uh, for many years in World War II. They did build a tandem one with a front and back passenger thing for the military. And uh, there's, I think they built several hundred of those. There's a few of those survivors around. But their real bread and butter was the plain old Model B Taylor craft like this with the side-by-side -side seating, 65 horsepower, later 85 horsepower, and uh, and wheels instead of sticks. Have you ever flown one, Jesse? I have not. Oh, yeah. well, too bad you're not staying long enough. We could take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> I've flown Andrews and I've flown, I think, Matt's. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, never just out. Actually, I flew a, a newer one. Did you? Yeah, yeah. the 15. F-19? Yeah, or? yeah I yeah. can't remember. Yeah. Had 135 horse on it or something. Right, it's pretty, right. pretty nice. But uh, one thing I noticed that it it floats. It do, it has a hard time slowing down. It, yeah, they've always had that reputation. If you if you're a little fast trying to land, you'll go all the way down the runway in the air. In fact, I almost did that coming in here before. Yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. A little fast. Yeah. Yeah, it just uh, it gets down in that ground effect and just floats on the cushion and it's very streamlined airplane. It's very fast. It was very maneuverable. Yep. Yeah. Um, I used to do an aerobatic act in this one where I go to 4,000 feet, shut the engine off, do a 10 turn spin and do some loops and rolls and stuff and then glide in and land and it, it does not have a starter on it so you couldn't start it again. But uh, Sounds like Ernst kind of Kessler the... from the Great Waldo Pepper. <laughs> right, right. But part of the thing being because it's so efficient so even with the engine off you could do loops and rolls and stuff. Huh. We should do that now. <laughs> I haven't done it in a while. I'm out of practice. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, we'll probably do just some uh, close-up shots of each plane. and uh, But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Quick little video, it's probably like way too long, but hit that like and subscribe button. Thank you, Jesse, for coming here. Thanks for letting me invite myself over. <laughs> yeah, and Andrew, thanks for being here. Hey. And, and uh, man, we're always trying to have fun. If I have time, I would have a lot more of this stuff out here. But, uh, but yeah, we'll see you guys. Everyone, aviation world, take care, and uh, blue skies.